So uh, I want to tell you about some problems involving uh, uh, divisibility of binomial coefficients that came up in a real research problem. Uh, I won't tell you too much about the research problem. Maybe I'll mumble a word or two at the end. Uh, but let me start off by just uh, making sure everyone knows what a binomial coefficient uh, is. Uh, I understand this is a, I see a lot of family students here, but I just, I know this is a public lecture also for uh, high school students. Uh, so I'm going to write uh, N choose K, uh, and that's, uh, okay, that's not showing up the way I think it should. I'm gonna write N choose K, uh, with those uh, parentheses uh, to mean uh, n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. And I guess I'm assuming that you know what a factorial is, but if you don't, it's just uh, this uh, n times n minus one times all the way down business. So n choose k, you take n times n minus one times n minus two, all the way down to three times two times one. You divide it by k times k minus one times k minus two, and you also divide it by n minus k, n minus k minus one, and so forth. Uh, I didn't write the last one out. So for example, five choose two, I'm taking five factorial over two factorial times three factorial. So 120 over two times six or 10. Just, uh, just calculating. So these are called binomial coefficients and they come up in a lot of different counting problems uh, and uh, some other places. Okay, so why should you care about these binomial coefficients? Well, I'm gonna tell you about three reasons. The first one I'll tell you about carefully. I suspect that many of you, or maybe all of you uh, know this. Uh, N choose K is the number of ways to pick a set of K elements out of a set of N elements. So to choose a subset of K from a set of N. So for example, if you want to form a team of three people from a larger group of six people, then, uh, well, how do you do this? Well, you choose someone and there's six people, so there are six choices. And then you choose a second person uh, and you've already uh, taken one person, so there are five people left you can choose. And then the third person, you've taken two people. So there are four people left you can choose. So you get six times five times four. But uh, there, the order that you picked people didn't matter because we're just taking a team. You know, it's a team of people that are all equal with one another. Uh, we don't have a boss and a second boss or anything like that. So there were uh, three factorial, six ways of ordering our choices. So we divide by that uh, to get uh, the uh, total number of possible teams, six choose three, six times five times four, divided by the possible orderings. So this is 20. Okay. and. Uh, if you're uh, seeing this for the first time, uh, now is a good time to interrupt with a question. If it doesn't make complete sense. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, uh, I can't necessarily see you on Zoom with the technology I'm using. Uh, and I should have said earlier, uh, you will want to have your Zoom and speaker view uh, since uh, I'm uh, showing you the Zoom uh, there, it's the usual trouble with a hybrid lecture. 
uh, too many things to think about. Okay, so probably everyone knew this, but you know, so if you want to, if you've got three mathematicians, Alice, Bob, Sveiko, Dasha, Erika, and Franci, uh, then, uh, well, I've actually listed out all the teams that you can choose here. Uh, I've uh, uh, got uh, all the teams with A there in the first columns, all the teams with B but not A in the second column, and so forth and so on. Uh, you can count up and see that I have 20. It's amusing to notice here that uh, uh, this six choose three is the same as five choose two plus four choose two plus three choose two plus two choose two, which correspond to the columns. That's because uh, if I pick, uh, if I decide for sure that A is gonna be on the team, then I've got five people left to pick the other two from. If I know that A is not on the team, but B is on the team, then I've got four people left to pick two from, and so forth and so on. Okay. The uh, other place that uh, this comes up, uh, which I don't know if it's really separate or not, uh, but N choose K is the uh, coefficient of x choose k in 1 plus x to the end. And the right way to think about this is as a special case uh, of uh, n choose k being the number of ways of choosing a set of k from a set of n. Because uh, what am I doing here? Well, I'm uh, expanding out 1 plus 6 to the x. Uh, so, well, oh man, one plus x to the sixth, uh, and I've got six factors, six one plus x factors, and I could think of them as being a, b, c, d, e, and f. So now, if I want to get an x cubed, uh, I need three of those factors to give me an x. Uh, and the other three to give me a one. Okay, so uh, it might be uh, uh, simpler uh, to look at uh, the coefficient of x to the first. Uh, so six x to the first I want to think of that as x times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 uh, times 1 plus uh, 1 times x times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 times x times 1 times 1 times 1. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps I could then at that point put uh, plus dot, 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 because there are uh, three more terms, and that's a lot of writing. Uh, so what am I doing? Well, I'm uh, ordering the contribution from these factors, and I need one of them to give an x and the others to give a 1. Uh, so I'm just picking the one that gives an x here. Uh, for uh, x squared or x cubed, uh, I think I'm not going to even get halfway writing it, so maybe I will leave that b. Okay, so in any case, if you take 1 plus x to the 6th, you'll get these uh, binomial coefficients for 6 uh, listed out as coefficients. Uh, this is the start of the technique of generating functions, which you might see in uh, later classes. Um, so this is helpful both if you want to know the coefficients of powers of 1 plus x, uh, but also you can play with the, uh, these binomial uh, powers uh, to learn things about the binomial coefficients, so to learn things about uh, the number of ways of choosing teams and solving other combinatorial problems. I'll show you some examples of this in a little while.
Okay, so where does the name binomial coefficient come from? Well, uh, a polynomial is something where you've got sums of lots of powers of x. So if you just have one plus x, you could call that a binomial since poly many, a uh, mono would be one. So a monomial is just one power, binomial, two things. And you uh, are looking at powers. Uh, I didn't make up the name. Okay, yeah, you might have seen this also through Pascal's triangle. Uh, I have a picture of Pascal there. Um, now, uh, another reason to care about n choose k that you might not have thought about before uh, is through symmetry. Uh, so, uh, I uh, see a lot of Thaumit students uh, uh, in the audience, so maybe I'll go ahead and say that uh, uh, symmetry comes down to group theory, um, and maybe I should stop talking about that at this point. But, uh, well, I've got a picture at least of some symmetric objects here uh, from a place I used to work in uh, Qatar. Um, now, uh, one kind of symmetry uh, is uh, uh, just rearranging or reordering the number of the elements in a set. So if you've got uh, the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, or mathematicians, uh, Alice, Bob, Sveiko, Dasha, uh, Eva, no, Erika, and Franci, um, uh, then you could uh, reorder them in a lot of different ways. Uh, uh, how many ways can you re reorder them? Well, you might uh, already know that that's n factorial because you've got n choices for where a goes. And then once you picked where a goes, there are n minus one places to put b and so forth and so on. Uh, I guess I'm taking n equals six here if I have a, b, c, d, e, and f. So, um, it's also interesting to restrict your arrangements sometimes uh, and to look at just uh, the number of uh, rearrangements of a set where you keep the first k elements and you keep the last n minus k elements. So, you move around the first k elements however you want. You move around the last n minus k elements however you want but you don't mix the two. Okay, so if I did this with, uh, uh, in the examples that I have above, uh, A, C, B, D, E, F would leave the first three elements fixed, but move, um, uh, and the last three elements fixed, but it makes some movement among the first three elements. So, well, you count up the number of ways of doing that, and you get k factorial times n minus k factorial. And your n choose k is the ratio of these two. Uh, so um, I'm interested in this uh, for experts in the room, uh, because this is an index of a subgroup in the symmetric group uh, or in the uh, alternating group. Okay, so this uh, it leads you towards group theory and to some questions that are important and have some applications. So, uh, motivated by this group theory point of view, uh, my uh, uh, co-author, John Shereshian, I have a picture of him there, uh, and uh, myself uh, asked the following question. Pick your favorite number n. Um, think maybe not too small, uh, six or 15 or a million. Um, and the question I want to ask is, uh, uh, regardless of which number you picked, 
can I always find two primes, uh, I'll call them P and R, so that every non-trivial binomial coefficient is divisible by at least one of the two primes. Okay, so this is uh, motivated by a problem in symmetry. Uh, it's completely equivalent to a certain uh, problem with uh, uh, on generation of the alternating group uh, for uh, experts in the room and closely related to some other interesting generation problems. So uh, just to be clear what we're talking about, uh, let's look at a couple of uh, small numbers. Uh, so if you look at six, uh, well, it's enough for me to look at uh, six choose one, six choose two, and six choose three, because choosing a two element set uh, is the same thing as choosing uh, four things not to be in the set. Uh, so there's a symmetry here. Uh, so I just need to look at six choose one, six choose two, and six choose three. And well, I've got six, 15, and 20. So I've got a bunch of prime pairs that'll work. I need at least one of two or three. And then I can take uh, the other one to be uh, five or uh, or the other prime. Okay, so that's uh, sort of doesn't look too interesting. Uh, life gets a little bit more interesting at 15. Uh, I mean, again, 15 is not too hard. You look at these, uh, you run out of space uh, after you get to 15, choose four. So let's uh, just compress and not write the choose notation. Uh, the numbers are uh, 15, 105, 455, 1365, 3003. Okay, you can read the rest of them. Maybe it's not so valuable for me to read them out loud. So again, there are several choices for uh, pairs of primes uh, that could work. Um, what? Uh, I lost my cursor. Okay. Um, well, uh, the ones that probably leap straight out at you are uh, three and five. Uh, those are actually, th that's not maybe such a protective way to follow. Uh, so this is a special circumstance because 15 is three times five. So it's the product of two primes, which makes uh, things a little nicer. Um, 3 and 13, or 5 and 13, uh, also uh, work. Uh, that uh, may not be completely obvious, but you can sit and work out that 3003 is divisible by 13. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you a, a way to get this in a, a few minutes. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, n choose zero or n choose n is one. That's not divisible by anything, so I'm ignoring that. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, uh, tell you what we know. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to fix some notation. Uh, uh, I've got P and R. Well, uh, the number n that you're looking at is the same thing as n choose 1, right? Because if you want to choose a one element set, then you just pick one guy and ways to, to pick it. Uh, so I want p to be the, uh, a prime that divides n, uh, and I want r to be the other prime. r is going to be pretty big, typically. Uh, so just go ahead and think of it as being... I mean, P will be pretty small and a divisor. R is going to be often close to N. We'll see. Uh, so uh, 
in a preprint that just went up on the archive, the main preprint server for math uh, this year, uh, we show that the answer is yes uh, out to 10 to the 15th. So uh, that's uh, one quadrillion. Let's see, you have a thousand and then a million with six zeros. A wait, a billion with nine zeros, a trillion with 12 zeros. Yeah, so a quadrillion with 15 zeros. Uh, and I want to uh, try to tell you uh, uh, sort of how we did this. OK, uh, so let me switch to my pad. And uh, what I want to do uh, is uh, revisit 15. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll come back to 15 a couple of times because 15, it's nice. It's big enough to be interesting, but small enough that you can calculate everything. Um, so uh, let me look at this uh, R equals 13 and focus on that for a second. Uh, so R equals 13, uh, this uh, divides 15 factorial, uh, but uh, not one factorial, not two factorial, not three factorial, not four factorial. It, um, you know, because 12 factorial, you're just uh, multiplying the numbers up to 12. 13 is a prime, and it's not on the list. Okay, 13 does divide 13 factorial, however. Uh, so uh, 13 divides... Uh, 15 choose 3. It doesn't divide 15 choose 1 or 15 choose 2, because those have a 13 factorial or a 14 factorial on the bottom. But it does divide 15 choose 3, 15 choose 4, uh, all the way up to 15 choose 12. And uh, so now by symmetry, we need only uh, find a P dividing uh, 15 choose 1, which is just 15, and uh, 15 choose 2, which is 105, uh, and either 3 or 5 work. OK. Uh, and I, I, I apologize. I've got a lot of things going on. If I start going way out of frame with the notes here, please tell me. Uh, OK. Any questions so far? OK. All right. So. Um, to get out to uh, a quadrillion, uh, what we did was uh, uh, first apply this idea very thoroughly with a lot of uh, computational shortcuts and uh, uh, the uh, uh, computer science aspects of this were non-trivial, uh, and then applied another similar idea to deal with the remaining. Let me expand. Uh, OK, so, so the first thing I, I want to do is just really explain what's going on with 15 again. And I want to explain it in another way. Um, so I want to uh, uh, organize algebra. I, I don't want to look at all this. Uh, of 15 choose everything, or 15 choose everything, it's not so bad to look at. But if I start looking at, uh, you know, uh, a million choose 
uh, everything, that gets sort of inconvenient. And if you start looking at uh, 31416, uh, which is a particularly inconvenient number, it turns out, uh, uh, then I really don't want to do things by hand. So what I will do uh, instead is uh, use module P arithmetic, uh, which uh, I think uh, you might hear about in discrete math if you're a, a FOMNIT student. Uh, so this is just, uh, uh, you pretend that P is zero. Actually, you, you set P to be zero. Uh, and then you, follow out and you live in a world where P is zero. So um, this is just like the arithmetic you do with clock times, right? If it's, uh, uh, if we're on a 24 hour clock and you add, and it's uh, 23 hours, and then you make it one hour later, then it's zero hours and you start again. Uh, so, uh, it turns out that this gives you a consistent arithmetic. It's especially nice if you're doing it modulo a prime uh, for reasons. Um, okay, but uh, you follow the rules. Uh, if P is zero, then I guess twice P, it better also be zero because uh, twice zero is still zero. And uh, P plus one had better be the same thing as one because P is zeros, just like on a clock. Uh, if it's uh, 24 plus one, I mean, if it's 25 hours, then, uh, it's, uh, then it's one and stop saying 25. Okay, now uh, the reason this is helpful for divisibility uh, is that uh, a number m is divisible by a prime p uh, exactly if m is zero mod p. Okay, so uh, applying this uh, same idea that we did with 15, uh, well, basically that idea, uh, we get this uh, freshman's dream identity. So it's called the freshman's dream. A freshman is a first year student and sometimes first year students uh, would really like one plus x squared to be equal to one plus x squared. And I have a little lag here, sorry about that. Uh, that's not true, but, 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 if you're willing to work modulo p, modulo two in this case, uh, then it becomes true. Uh, right, since it's, of course, 1 plus 2x plus x squared, and 2x, well, 2 is 0. So that goes away. All right, and uh, you already probably have in mind the proof. Uh, you have uh, a prime p factorial on the top. p factorial is divisible by p. Uh, and if that's a prime, we can't have any p's on the bottoms of the binomials, so those all go away. Okay. Uh, more generally, if you take a prime power, more generally, uh, if you take a prime power, uh, the same thing works, and I can even show you a proof of that or show you, uh, I'll just show you for uh, one plus x squared. Uh, so if I take one plus uh, uh, x to the p squared, let's see, uh, that's uh, the same thing as, uh, 
can I do? Uh, one plus x to the p times p. So I guess that's equal to one plus x to the p to the p, which is uh, one plus x to the p squared. Am I, uh, am I doing exponent exponentiation here right? I'm very close to a big whiteboard, which it's well known makes you uh, a bit uh, dumber, uh, and I'm moving out of frame. In any case, uh, Applying uh, this identity uh, a couple of times uh, can really help with the problems. Uh, and I want to show you uh, 15 through the lens of this uh, uh, freshman's dream. Okay, so I will hide that again, uh, but I can put it up on a po little post-it note up there. Um, so let's see. Uh, I want to look at 1 plus x to the 15, uh, and I want to look at the binomial coefficients mod 13 and, say, mod 5. Okay? So if I look at this mod 13, then it's the same thing as 1 plus x to the 13 times 1 plus x squared. I haven't used the freshman dream identity yet, uh, but now uh, this is equal to mod 13, 1 plus x to the 13 times, I can't do anything with the 1 plus x squared since I'm mod 13. So I just have 1 plus 2x plus x squared. Oops. So now I have 1 plus uh, 2x plus x squared plus nothing for a while uh, plus, uh, what, x to the 13 plus uh, 2x to the 14 plus x to the 15. Okay, and this just tells me that the binomial coefficients uh, disappear uh, in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Now, uh, if I look mod 5, then I've got uh, 1 plus x to the 15. Mod 5, this is even nicer. Uh, I have uh, 1 plus uh, x to the 5 times 3. So that's uh, 1 plus x to the fifth cubed. So that's equal to uh, 1 plus 3x to the fifth, 3x to the tenth, uh, x to the fifteenth. Okay, so this shows me that the only uh, binomials that are not divisible by 13 are at 1 and 2 and the symmetric ones. The only uh, binomials that are not divisible by 5 are the multiples of 5. And it's important there that 5 is a divisor. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what's the important thing here? Well, it's that uh, before I get my first multiple of five, uh, I run out of these low uh, binomials uh, close to zero, or conversely, uh, you know, only after my x to the 10th do I get the 13 and the 14. 
So uh, using exactly this technique, uh, we can prove a theorem or a lemma. Uh, take your favorite positive integer and two primes. Uh, if I have it so that uh, p to the a is a power of p that divides n, and uh, r is a prime just a little smaller than n, uh, you can generally take it to be the, the uh, prime, the, the largest prime before n. Uh, if you have it so that uh, the sum of these is bigger than n, then you win with those two primes. Okay. And the proof is just exactly what I did for, uh, for 15. Uh, the, uh, 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 p to the a, uh, uh, or p divides except that n choose p to the a, n choose 2 p to the a, and so forth by the freshman's dream. And, uh, uh, R handles everything except for a few small and a few uh, very big uh, coefficients. Okay, so you can deal with lots of numbers with this. So n equals 15 with R equals 13 works great. Uh, n equals 300 with R equals 293 works. Let's see, so why... Uh, why will that work? Let's see, 300, oh, 25 divides 300, and 25 plus 293 is, is big enough. Mm -hmm. So um, the condition for this lemma is met most of the time. Um, more on what I mean by that, but it's not met always. Uh, so a good example is uh, 210. Uh, now, you might not know off the top of your head, but you can check that the uh, largest prime before 210 is 199, and the largest prime power divisor of 210 is 7. And 7 plus 199 is just too small. So we're going to have to do something else with 210 and with some other numbers like 210. Okay. So, uh, so what went wrong there? Well, we had a relatively large gap between primes. Uh, and we had a number which had uh, just only small prime power divisors in that gap. Uh, and when that happens, uh, you can get into, well, you, you can uh, have a situation where you can't uh, automatically win by this lemma. Now, this lemma is just a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary condition, so it doesn't kill us. Um, but uh, uh, if you're going out to a quadrillion, this lemma is doing all the work for a computation. Uh, mm, by all the work, I mean almost all the work. Um, the, uh, the condition is met here for, uh, it, it fails only for uh, uh, 20, about 26 million numbers. And 26 million, uh, that's nothing compared with a quadrillion. Um, so uh, to check uh, to check that we only had 26 million exceptions uh, to this lemma or to the conditions for this lemma uh, took uh, 10 days with uh, some pretty serious or moderately serious computing hardware uh, running um, 15 parallel threads with uh, optimized uh, C code. Uh, Yeah. Uh, is 210, uh, let's see. 
I, I'm not positive. I, I'm lying a tiny bit here and that I, I actually want R to be smaller than N minus one, not just smaller than N. Uh, and uh, when you put that already, 30 is a, a problematic. Um, uh, 210 is the first uh, sort of nasty case. Um, indeed, uh, some authors published that 210 was an exception to this, uh, uh, exception to our larger question. Uh, I mean, you know, they did it as an aside because they hadn't noticed that you don't need this lemma. Okay, now, uh, uh, why only 26 uh, million? Well, yeah, so you can use the same lemma and the ideas about uh, uh, prime gaps and small prime factors uh, to also do some non-computational work, uh, I mean, to actually show that things work and not just compute that they work out to some point. Uh, so, uh, um, if you believe the Riemann hypothesis, whatever that is, uh, the conditions of this lemma are, are met with asymptotic density one. Uh, I'm not going to carefully say what asymptotic density one means, but it, le it means that uh, roughly that numbers uh, where the condition is not met become rarer and rarer. Uh, and uh, uh, you expect very few of them. Um, okay, so the Riemann hypothesis, I'll just say it's a famous conjecture which has to do with the distribution of primes. Um, you know, so this is explaining 26 million is uh, very few problematic numbers uh, out to uh, a quadrillion. I mean, you know, it's, well, let's see, 10 to the sixth times 10 to the ninth is 10 to the 15th. So it's something like, uh, well, it's a bit more than one in a billion. Now, um, I'm sort of excited. Uh, uh, I mean, so I'm not a number theorist, uh, uh, and I'm not even, I'm not a number theorist, and I couldn't even play one on TV very convincingly. Uh, so it was exciting to be able to do something with the Riemann hypothesis. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not uh, an expert on this kind of stuff. Yoni uh, Terevainen, um, if anyone knows how to pronounce Finnish names better than I, uh, please tell me. Uh, he uh, uh, took this uh, uh, and ran it a bit further. Uh, he's, uh, if I understand right, not just using this lemma, but using that plus some uh, related ideas. Uh, so this, uh, he shows that this binomial divisibility question uh, has a yes answer with uh, asymptotic density one. Uh, he does this in a very strong form. Uh, you can see that the title here has is something about alternating groups. Uh, so uh, uh, there's uh, some strengthening there. Uh, he also, you can see from the abstract, has an explicit uh, upper bound on how many exceptions there could be to uh, to this. Okay, so what do we do with the, the remaining numbers? Um, well, uh, you'd, I mean, we were stuck on this for a while. This is the thing that we really improved in this uh, new paper with uh, Goralnik. Um, the idea is uh, instead of looking, I mean, if you can find an R so that uh, R plus uh, the large prime power divisor is uh, bigger than n, then that's great. 
But if you can't do that, uh, try 2R instead, or 3R, or 4R, or so forth and so on, and work similarly. Uh, let me uh, let me show you how this works uh, with uh, with 210, say. So if I look at uh, n equals 210, uh, we don't have a, a good prime close enough to 210. Um, so I look at 210 over 2, which is uh, 105. And 103 happens to be prime. Okay, so now I look at uh, 1 plus x to the 210, modulo 103, uh, and I see what happens. Well, it's 1 plus x to the 103 squared uh, times uh, 1 plus x to the fourth. Right. Uh, so let's see, 2 times 103 is 206, plus 4 is 210. All right. So now, uh, well, uh, I've got uh, now 1 plus uh, x to the uh, 2x to the 103 plus x to the 206 times uh, 1 plus uh, 4x plus 6x squared plus 4x to the 4th plus uh, 4x cubed plus x to the 4th. Okay, uh, and uh, so I get uh, some small primes, which are easy to deal with. And then I get some stuff that's around 103. Uh, so let's see, I guess I get x to the 103 plus uh, 4x to the 104 plus uh, uh, 6x to the 105. Okay, and I, mean, I get some more terms. I'm not going to write out everything. Uh, also, I'm running out of space. Um, so, I mean, this is not too much to knock out. Uh, so I try to work mod 7. Uh, so if I take 1 plus x to the 210 mod 7, uh, well, that's uh, 1 plus uh, x to the 7 squared to the 4th times 1 plus x to the 7 squared. So what I'm doing here basically is writing uh, 210 and base 7, uh, but uh, I've got uh, four 49s uh, and two 7s. Uh, so, uh, well, let's see, that's going to be uh, non-zero at, uh, at uh, x to the 98 and x to the 105. And the 105 is going to be a problem. So what do I do? I give up on 7, and I look at 5 instead. And 5 is more tractable. I get 1 plus uh, what, 5, uh, 1 plus x to the 5 cubed 
uh, 1 plus x to the 5 squared cubed, 1 plus x to the 5 squared. So I've just written 210 as 125 plus 3 times 25 plus 2 times 5. Okay. Uh, And here I do get zero coefficients around x to the 105. Uh, I've got uh, uh, I've got some non-zero coefficients around 75 and around 125, uh, which the 103 will deal with. This uh, it just deals with the coefficients left uh, by 103. Okay, so uh, to compute out to uh, a trillion, to deal with these 26 million exceptions, uh, we uh, do techniques just like what I did with 210. Uh, we uh, didn't automate them uh, uh, completely, uh, or we didn't, uh, I don't know why five is really different from seven in that example, uh, but uh, I can check five, I can check seven, and the computer does that pretty quickly, and there's only 26 million things to check. That's, that's nothing compared with a quadrillion. Um, okay, so if you want a fun problem, uh, take... A, 31416. Uh, it's a coincidence that this looks a little bit like pi or some multiple of pi. Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a particularly annoying one. Uh, it might give you some amusement. I'll, I'll even give you a hint. Uh, 7853 is a pretty good value of R. It's uh, it's uh, about a fourth of uh, three one four one six. So uh, that's about all I have to say. I have pictures of uh, me and co-authors. I don't have one of us together, but uh, I cobbled it together, and I have a picture of the view across Isola. And thank you, Palalepa.